Hi, my name's Adam. Welcome to the channel. Thanks for joining us today. Today we're going to talk about an article that I actually found in Costco Connection, the Costco magazine. And you know, I run through it, I get it every whatever month or so, and, and I run through it. And there's always you know a tech article in there, a finance article, and then you know food that my wife uh, ends up cooking for us. But um, usually I don't look too much at these articles, but this one actually stood out to me. And it was basically you know, 11 steps or 11 kind of processes that you can follow to get your finances on track, under understanding your finances better. And trust me, I talk to a lot of you every single day. I see your comments. A lot of you are a mess, a financial mess, and that's okay. We're never taught financial literacy in school. There's no programs out there. There's just not a lot of access for you to learn, to understand, and to get a better handle. So hopefully these 11 help you out. I'm gonna give you kind of a tip on each one as well. This is for every single age. You know, obviously if you're gearing up in your 20s, 30s, 40s, you're in savings mode. Where do you save? How do you save? How do you pay off debt? Build a credit score. All that stuff is obviously very important. As you get older in life, if you get into your 50s, 60s, 70s, and you get closer to or into retirement, a lot of you just say, ah, budget, gone, right? You hit your 50s, budget, gone. Savings, gone. That doesn't change. All the kind of the things that you implement earlier in life, you need to continue later in life. And if you didn't implement them earlier, you need to change things to get them on track now. So the first tip they have is to better understand your financial literacy or have better financial literacy. And really that comes down to spending time to educate yourself. Now, how do you go about this? How do you learn? Well, you can watch YouTube videos like this, right? YouTube videos, there's a lot out there. Some are good, some are bad, but you can kind of get a feel for, okay, this makes sense to me, this doesn't. How do I save better? What is a TFSA and RSP? There's lots of videos out there. We've done a lot of them. Many other content creators have done them. You can go to advisor.ca, moneysense.ca. Some of these websites that provide really good articles. Again, if you're looking to learn on CPP, just Google Doug Runchy. Um, he's got a lot of great, I think there's about 30, 30 or 40 articles that he's done on that. We also have an internal class that we offer, the Financial Master Class. And it's that, it's basically, we built it to give financial literacy to Canadians. So it covers everything from budgeting to building your credit score to you know how do you save, how do you retire, what is a financial retirement and estate plan. It kind of breaks down the A to Z and just gives you the tools you need to make better decisions going forward. So we'll link that below as well. We do offer that master class. Um, I would say the master class is geared for that 20 to 45 year old, kind of starting out. If you're getting close to retirement, master class isn't geared for you, but we are working on a few more courses and whatnot that will help you guys. So those are coming. But if you're in that 20 to 45 age bracket watching this and you kind of want to up your game on financial literacy, check out the masterclass. The second thing to do is build out a personal financial plan. And depending on what stage of life you're at, this could be more of a budget, where to save money, how much can you save, all of that. If you're in the middle ground, right? Kids are getting near to out of the home, maybe the mortgage is almost paid off. Maybe you're getting an advancement in career, you don't have kids, whatever it is. There's, there's so many things that could be happening. Typically age 35 to 50, that's kind of the bucket, usually 40 to 50. You have more free cash flow. How do you save that? Now you're starting to make a bigger impact on your retirement savings. So get a financial plan put in place. Again, not necessarily a retirement plan. A lot of you that are kind of 40, 45 under, you don't need a retirement plan per se, you need a financial plan. And that's really, where does my cash flow go? So how much cash do I have coming in? Where does it go out? And any extra, where should I be allocating that? Obviously all that has to gear to your retirement plan and what it means for retirement, but it's more about what do we do with free cash flow today? If you don't have that plan, you wanna start putting one in place. The third thing is to build up an emergency fund. And as we know, going through the you know, last couple of years, there's been emergencies. A lot of you have had them or you know someone that has had one. So you wanna make sure that you have a good emergency fund and that that's safe money and accessible to you. So whether it's in just a high interest savings account, whether it's in a redeemable GIC, anything that you have you know, easy access to. Now you're not gonna be making a lot of money on this and a lot of interest on that, but that's okay. The purpose of an emergency fund is to not get a big rate of return, but to be there for when you need it. So make sure you build up an emergency fund before you start saving into RSPs and TFSAs and everything else, because if you don't have that emergency fund, you're gonna have to be dipping into that down the road anyway. So kind of build out that foundation of an emergency fund first. I always recommend even in retirement to have some sort of emergency fund or cash, something that's there for you. A lot of you when you get to retirement, I know use a HELOC or you know, line of credit against your home, which is a good solution. Just make sure you have some sort of plan. So if you have that emergency, a lot of you downsize to condos in retirement and you could have a one-time assessment on your condo. 
and owe $30,000, $40,000. Where is that coming from? How are you finding it? Have a plan. The fourth thing she lists on this article is to do your homework. And this really comes around, do your homework on who you're working with, you know, what kind of investment products you're into, what kind of insurance you bought. Don't just jump into something. Educate yourself. Again, this kind of goes back to point one is you know, get financial literacy and then it allows you to do your homework better, right? It's just like back in school. If you educate yourself, build knowledge, the homework becomes a lot easier because you know what to look for and what to ask. Some of these financial planners that work for big companies, they're basically told what to do and what to sell. Is that best for the client or best for them? This is the type of homework you want to be doing. So look at who you're working with currently or who you're looking to work with going down the road. Is it a good fit for you? Are they making decisions on your behalf or on their behalf? Now, I know sometimes it's hard to kind of do homework. Like Adam, I don't know if my advisor is putting me into, you know, this fund for them or for me. It seems like it's for me, but I have no idea. Now, in a few uh, tips from now, I'll get into cost, what it should be costing you. And that'll kind of help gear your direction too. Maybe you're paying too much. That's a good step to start looking elsewhere. So I'll go through that here in a minute as well. The fifth recommendation is to use your workplace plan. And it blows my mind how many of you have a group RSP at work, they do some sort of matching, and you don't take advantage of it. Yet, you maybe complain or you wish you got a raise. Getting free matching on your group RSP is like getting a raise. I get it. You have to commit some money yourself to the plan in order for them to match, but you should be saving anyway. So if you have a company work plan, use it. And especially if they're matching, if they're going to match you, let's say sometimes it's a dollar amount. So a hundred dollars a paycheck. Sometimes it's a percentage amount, you know, three or 5% of your pay. You want to make sure you're taking advantage of that. That's a free pay raise. You want to be saving anyway. So if you can save only a hundred dollars a month and your company is matching you a hundred dollars a month, that needs to be the place that you save because your rate of return is a hundred percent right off the top. A lot of you may not even know if your uh, work has a group plan. You need to look into that. If they do start maximizing those benefits. The sixth item in the article is to use government programs. And they're talking about, you know, TFSA, RSP, make sure if you guys don't use an RSP and you have you know, income over 50, 60,000 a year. A lot of you have this fallacy of like, ah, an RSP doesn't make sense. Like I save tax now, but I pay it later. So it's just a wash. That's not true. I do financial plans every single day. RSPs are a powerful tool if used properly. Same with a tax-free savings account. Make sure you understand how a tax-free savings account works, how it's most beneficial to you. It is not most beneficial to you by putting money in a tax-free savings and investing it in a high interest savings account at 1%. That is not a benefit to you. So understand, we have a few videos on this. We'll link them below or search our channel. Other people, Brandon Beavis has a great video on TFSA as well. They're, they're out there. Do your research on this. Understand how TFSAs work, what your limits are, how to invest in them, how to utilize them to build more wealth for yourself and those around you. The seventh thing is don't chase past returns. And a lot of you do this, right? I, I think it's just our general mindset as human beings to say, look, oh, you know, that made money in the past. And I remember years ago when I sold mutual funds and every year we get a chart that would show us, you know, what category did the best and worst for the year. So it might be you know, emerging markets made 15% and then US equity and Canadian equity and bonds and you know, whatever it is. So it had this chart, it had about 10 different areas and, and it would show year by year by year. And you'd see emerging markets would be best this year, but last year it was bottom and it kind of bounced around. Things bounce around. But I always remember showing that chart to clients and showing them like how things change and they say, oh wait, Emerging markets, let's go there. That's that's hot right now. And I think we have to get out of that because it, it's hurting you, it's hurting your investment portfolio. Build a portfolio with a portfolio manager that will suit your ongoing cash flow, retirement, tax plan, all of that. It has to fit that. So don't just chase past returns, but look at best structure for your portfolio going forward. Number eight, which ties into number seven, is know your risk tolerance. And a lot of you are taking too much risk and even more of you, I would say that I talked to, aren't taking enough risk. Um, you're sitting in bonds, you're sitting in cash, you're worried about what the market's doing. And I get it. A lot of you watching these videos, you're close to or into retirement. You know, you can't buffer the big swings. I get that. But if you have a good plan in place, I've talked about this at nauseum on this channel. If you have a good plan, a good cash flow plan, know how much cash you need to redeem out of your accounts every year, keep that money working for you. If you need $40,000 a year out of your RSP or 20,000, whatever the number is, have 12 to 24 months of that in cash. So you got the next two years of cash flow in cash. The rest of it can be working for you. And this is the whole fallacy of when you hit retirement, that doesn't mean you need all of your retirement income coming to you. It's a bit at a time, typically six to 10%. That's how much you need to pull out. So maybe 20% of your portfolio is in cash, the rest of it, 
should be working for you. If it's not, you're probably losing out. The ninth thing is a big, big thing for me, and this is monitor your cost. Now, there's two types of costs that you're gonna look at in our industry. Cost of the investment and cost of planning. Typically, these two are merged into one. And if you own a mutual fund, it's called an MER, a management expense ratio. And that is typically the average man management expense ratio in Canada is 2.32%, which is way too high. Some of you, and I, we onboarded a client the other day, were paying 2.95%. They were in a segregated fund, which is like a mutual fund, but in an insurance company. There's many different types of products out there, different fees out there, and how they charge those fees. We have seen advisors put their client in a mutual fund that charges an MER over 2%, and then they charge an advising fee on top of that, so the client ends up paying over 3%, which is absolutely bonkers. So if you're in a mutual fund, review the fee. There's something called a fun fact. A fun fact, there's a fun fact for every single fund in Canada that will show you a breakdown of how the funds invested and all that. But typically on page three, it'll show you the fees. And there's two fees you wanna look at and you add them together to get your total fee. MER, management expense ratio, and TER, trading expense ratio. Typically an advisor will not disclose that TER. Typically it's a smaller fee, but it, it is a fee. And on smaller funds, it can get quite expensive. So look at your overall cost. If you're north of two, 2.1%, you might be paying a little bit too much. Typically you wanna be as close to 2% or under. Once you hit half a million dollars, you should be under 2%. So if your account value, overall asset value is under half a million, look to be paying around 2%. And that includes two things, remember, investment and advice. Investments usually about 1%, advice is 1%. If you're paying 2%, you say, yeah, perfect, Adam, I'm paying 2%, I'm good. But you're not getting any advice, then what are you paying that other 1% for? If your advisor is more, you know, you can reach out to them and get advice and get help when you need it, perfect. You're paying for something that you're getting, that's great. But if you can't get a hold of your advisor, you haven't heard from them in five years, you have no idea where they live anymore, that's ah, probably time to switch advisors. Either move to a new advisor if you need help with that, do DIY, hire a fee for service planner. There's different options out there. Over half a million dollars, so about a million to uh, half a million to two million dollars, you should be paying in that one and a half percent up to 1.75. That's typically the range. Over two million, it'll scale down a little bit from there. So that should be the range. You shouldn't be paying much more than 2%, yet most of you watching this video are paying closer to 2.5%. Even DIY, a lot of people think, I can go DIY and save a lot of money. You want to start adding up what you're buying, you know, the time that you're putting into it, all of that. It's like going to an accountant, right? You pay an accountant for a service and they provide a service and cost a fee. Same with a financial planner. If you're paying two and a half, three percent where you could be paying one and a half to two, that one percent every year is eating away at your overall retirement plan. It is. Now, good advice is well worth it. I can tell you firsthand, we, you know, we provide financial plans to clients across Canada and it makes a big difference. But again, if you're paying for the planning piece and not getting it, then you wanna look for a new advisor that's gonna actually provide that ongoing planning for you because you are paying something for that. So be aware of that. So make sure you understand what you're paying and if you're paying over 2%, 2.1%, maybe time to start looking at that and if that's the best solution for you going forward. The 10th thing is to pay attention. Um, and this doesn't mean jump into your account and watch it every day. I typically say jump into your account every few weeks, once a month. I go into my account once a month. When I get my statement, I jump in there, look, I know what I own in my account. I know how it's doing roughly because I'm quite connected with BCV, obviously, for our clients. So a bit different for me, but I would recommend if you're the type of person that gets nervous looking at your account during the little ups and downs, look at it less often. Trust your advisor that's working. And if you can't trust your advisor, you need to move on. But trust your advisor. If you're a DIY investor, you're gonna need to jump in there a bit more often, obviously. But if you have a managed account that someone's taking care of, once a month, once a quarter even should be lots. If you trust your advisor, leave it to them. But you wanna pay attention. You wanna pay attention to transactions. You know, at the beginning of the year, it's like, are you taking advantage of the TFSA account? Are you using your RSP? Like, pay attention to flow. Like, learn things on this channel, on other channels, read stuff online, educate yourself, and then kind of take a step back to your accounts and pay attention to what's happening. Does it make sense based on what you learned? and what's happening. If they don't line up, ask your advisor the tough questions. That's what they're there for, they're there to help you, but they're there to answer the tough questions that you have. And the 11th and maybe the most important is be skeptical. 
And I think this is for anything in life, but man, do I talk to a lot of you that tell me, oh, I'm getting 15 to 20% of my investments every year. That's a massive, massive red flag. And I know a lot of you have talked to you, you know, you're in real estate investments and this and that. And yeah, no, I've done this for 20 years and I get 15 to 20% every year. I hear as many stories on the other side where people are big companies and they just go sideways and they lose their investments and it delays their retirement. Look, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And that's the mentality I have. It's the same one you should have. If it sounds too good to be true, if I sat on this channel and said, Hey, look, I have a great investment for you. That's going to guarantee 15 to 20%, blah, 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 blah. Be skeptical. And there's a lot of people on YouTube online out there pushing a product that is guaranteeing that or saying, Hey, we're going to get you this big return. Sounds too good to be true. Walk away. Don't try to chase those returns to get a bigger retirement or retire you earlier. Typically those types of investments will delay your retirement and cost you money. So be skeptical both on product as well as planning. If a planner says, Hey, we can do this, that, the other thing and all this, it's like, okay, well show me your process a little bit. And we do that in our office, right? Like we show you like, here's the process that we go through for our clients. Here's how we do planning. Here's what we do. Here's the annual review. Here's what to expect if you partner with us going forward. So make sure you don't go chasing those returns on a broken promise. So be skeptical, but also build trust. Like once that skepticism is gone, build the trust with your advisor, lean into them, build that relationship. They can really be a good mentor for you and someone that can really partner with you through retirement or even leading up to retirement. So have skepticism up front, get past it, build that trust and work with your advisor going forward. So there you have it. I know a lot of you are Costco shoppers. You might get the Costco connection. You'll see the article in there. Uh, again, Costco obviously is a great place for us. I have four kids, so we get a ton of our food from there. Obviously we buy, have to buy in bulk, but again, Great article there. If I see more of them come across my plate, you know, I'll share them on this channel. Thank you for joining us in this video. And again, take two to three of these things that I talked about today. I talked about 11, grab two or three of them and start implementing them. Whether it's educating yourself, creating a financial plan, reviewing your investment fees, whatever it is, grab two or three of them and start rolling forward. Once you're done, checked off those two or three, come back to this video, grab two or three more, walk through this process. And I promise you, I promise you, you'll be in a better place down the road. So thank you again for joining us. We'll see you in the next video.